Amen. Praise the Lord. Good to see you this morning. It's good to see you this morning. <laughs> All rise and shine. Jesus is here. We ought to be here too. It's good to see you. Listen, I love the weather this morning. Woke up. They can just keep this all summer long. It'll be all right with me. <laughs> Amen. It's really enjoyable. This uh, message today is uh, a message. In fact, I looked into my sermon notes several weeks ago when I was really praying about the Lord have us do these next few Sundays. And this message came up on why your ship sinks. And I look back when I preached it. I think it was 20, uh, 2001 or 2000, I think, when I preached this message. So it's been quite a few years. But uh, I kind of slapped myself around because this is probably one of the simplifications of some most powerful biblical principles given to us in just a little section of Scripture. And so, you know, if you really want to get something out of this today, there's something for you to get. If you, didn't, if, if you, if you don't get anything out of this message, it's not because I'm a horrible preacher. This is so good, it, sounds, it makes horrible preachers sound good. All right? In other words, I believe there's a real word for you in this message today. In fact, I believe there's so much of a word here for you that you would be smart to either get your cell phone out and write it in notes or get a pencil and a piece of paper out or open up your Bible and make some notes because I'm going to share with you five things that can transform you on every kind of level of your life if you respond to them. These are very powerful biblical principles. Many of you know we've been in Proverbs for a long time. I'm, you know, 40 some odd weeks now we've been teaching in Proverbs and these five principles keep sounding out over and over again as I went back over in the book of Proverbs. And these are very important principles for our life and for life living. And some of these, these five things are obviously, as you go through Proverbs, real five important wisdom points. But this is, this is, this is a passage of Scripture that we call in, the, you know, Why Your Ship Sinks. A, a subtitle would be simply How to Avoid Major Disasters in Your Life which hopefully most of us want to avoid. I've had enough major disasters in my life. I'm not looking for any more. How about you? So it, most of the major disasters in my life have been self-inflicted. <laughs> Amen. As probably yours have been, self-inflicted. So this is how to avoid those kind of things in your life and move forward to better sailing in your life. And so we're going to look at a passage in Acts chapter 26, or chapter 27, and we'll start with verse 6. Where the Apostle Paul, he's been taken, you know, into captivity uh, by the Romans. They're on their way. They're taking up to meet Caesar in Rome. And so this is part of his journey getting there to Rome, which is not an easy journey to make without all the problems that they did have, but they had a lot of problems. But, it, you know, if we're, if we're going to look at... The, five or six scriptures in this today and from these there, there we'll make these simple points that I think really will be transformative if you'll hear what the spirit has to say in Acts chapter 27 verse 6 it says there the certain the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy this is the guy who's in charge of getting Paul to Rome all right and he put us aboard it and when he had sailed slowly for a good many days and with difficulty had arrived off Snidus since the wind did not permit us to go further we sailed under the shelter of Crete of Salmon, and with difficulty sailing past it, we came to a place called Fair Havens, near which is the city of Lycia. What he's saying here, this is not an easy trip. They've been fighting the wind, they've been fighting the storms. It's not a good time for sailing. When considerable time had passed at this city of Lycia, and the voyage was now dangerous, since even the fast was already over, Paul began to admonish them and said to them, Men, I perceive the, the voyage will certainly be with damage and with great loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. That's a pretty severe warning. But the centurion was more persuaded by the pilot and the captain of the ship than by what was being said by Paul because the harbor was not suitable for wintering. The majority reached a decision to put out to sea from there if somehow they could reach Phoenix, a harbor of Crete facing southwest and northwest and spend the winter there. But when a moderate wind, cool breeze came from the south, came up, supposing they had attained their purpose, they weighed the anchor and began sailing along Crete, close in shore. But before very long, they rushed down from the land of violent wind called Eurycolo, Eurycladon. And when the ship was caught in it, it could not face the wind. We gave way to it and let ourselves be driven Along. Now understand as we talk about these points within this message, it may just seem like a nice story that's happening here, but there are some real nuggets of gold speaking biblically 
and speaking a word of God to us today if we'll listen to what those little nuggets really are. Why does your ship sink? Why do you have these disasters? Have you ever noticed people who seem to always be living in shipwreck? Maybe you've noticed some people who perhaps have just seems to be they've, uh, they've dropped out on God. They used to be sailing along fine. Their life used to be really going good. Their family was together. Things were happening well. And then all of a sudden, over a certain period of time, literally, it just was a shipwreck of everything that was going on in your life. This message has important principles that regard that particular issue and how to avoid it. So this is not how to wreck your ship. We don't need any instruction there. All right? But this is why you're, you sh wreck your ship, which should help you to avoid the process of doing what we do so often that leads us into our own self-inflicted problems and self-inflicted disasters. First Timothy, Paul writes to him, he says, Timothy, you hold fast the faith, a good conscience, which some have put aside concerning faith, have made shipwreck. There are a lot of people that I've seen over the years in church, as well as in ministry, that used to be flying along really good until something happened in their life and it literally made shipwreck of their lives. They look like they're really going to do good. They seem to be doing well in the church. It seems like they're going to succeed in their walk with God. But something happens and they experience a, a cataclysmic failure in their life and seem to go down on the rocks in the middle of the storms. So I want to say to you, should you want to avoid that kind of cataclysmic failure in your spiritual life again, then it would do well for us to realize that, hey, there's some, there's some reasons that percolate in our soul and in our heart and our mind that can be destructive, and we need to learn what they are and learn how to avoid it. Now, first of all, before I get to the five, behind all these five of why your ship sinks and why you have a shipwreck, there's this one principle that just shadows all this, and it's the principle of unbelief. Ultimately, all these five things I'm going to mention to you come back to one thing, really. The Bible talks about in Hebrews, the children of Israel, that whole generation that came out of Egypt, it was their children that went into the promised land, not the elders. It says the adults died in the wilderness. It says they could not enter in because of their unbelief. In fact, in Hebrews, it also says they had an evil heart of unbelief. So the reason we don't succeed, first and foremost, in our spiritual walk of life really gets down to this. These five reasons I talk about, those are kind of the obvious outward signs that we have this, this, this heart of unbelief and this evil heart of unbelief. But cut to the chase here, all right? <laughs> Why does our ship sink? Why do we have these cataclysmic failures in our life? One is impatience. You know, as well as I, we're living in an instant right now society. I want what I want and I want it now. I don't have to work for it. I don't want to have to wait for it. I don't want to have to be disciplined for it. I just want what I want and I want it right now. Acts 27, 9 says, Now when much time was spent, and was sailing was now dangerous because the fast was already passed, Paul admonished them. There's a lot of people who just go down in their spiritual walk in life. There's a lot of marriages that fall down in their, in, in their relationship, in the, in, the, in the marriage relationship, because of this one thing right here. They just become impatient. This immaturity in their life leads them into a mindset that says, you know, I, if, I, you know if I married the right person, then they would be this way. Or if I had the right this situation in my life, it would be this way. Somehow we have this mindset that is so warped, we don't realize that I can be right dead center in the will of God and face storms. All right? There could be, you know, and, and I need to realize that the most important thing here is, where, what am I supposed to be doing? Paul had a word from God. They ignored the word, of, word from God. And they went with what was, you know, uh, based upon, like, we don't want to stay here. We, we want to move on down the road. We want to get away from this place and get to someplace else. A lot of people, now listen to me, they miss God in their life. And they miss the will of God in their life. Because they're more interested in, in, in when and now instead of what. What's God want? What's God want? And if I can first of all get a hold of what God wants, what is the will of God in my life, in this situation, what I'm facing right now, what is the will of God, and then hold on with an attitude of patience. It may not happen today. It may not happen this year. It may be a while before whatever it is blooms and blossoms and bears fruit. But I don't want to fail to believe that God is under control in all things. And what, what evidence of that in my life is this. I'm not pushing against God. I'm not trying to twist God's arm. I'm not trying to make something happen that shouldn't be happening at this point in time in my life. We need to be patient. We need to settle down. And when I'm not patient, 
I just want to get on my way, do my thing, whatever it might be. I know what God says, but that's when I end up in trouble because my impatience is first of all, more than anything else, and it's really an expression of my disbelief in God's sovereignty. By that I mean it's my expression of disbelief that I believe that God is able to do what he promised me he would do. And so I must help God. That never works. It never works that way. And every time you try to help God in that regard, we know faith without works is dead. I'm not talking about acts of obedience. I'm talking about acts of impatience. Where I'm trying to push God or make God or I know what God wants. And I may know the will of God, but I don't know the win of God. I need to hold on until God shows me and be faithful in it. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life by not waiting on God. And I'm sure if you were to be calculatively honest in your own life and look back and see where failures have been, it could well be the same testimony of your own life. We just need to settle down. We need to rest in the presence of God. We need to believe God. And we don't need to run with this attitude that, you know, that God may know everything, but I know better. Let me tell you something that will help you along the road. You don't know more than God. All right, you think you do. I know you're sitting in your situation right now, and you may be kind of steaming in your situation, saying, I need God to do this, need to do this now, yada, yada, yada. But God knows better than you do. You say, well, I don't think God knows all the facts. <laughs> Proving your stupidity again. God knows all the facts. But God doesn't understand how I feel. God understands how you feel about it. God was sent his son who became a man who understands all these feelings and was tempted in every measure just like you are. And he gave us, yes, he's the sinless son of God and he had the capacity because as God, but he gives us the perfect picture of what it means to live a Christian life. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to trust God. Jesus fasting 40 days. Turn these stones into bread. You can do that. Yeah, I can, but I'm not because that's not God's will. It is written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. What's he doing here? He's expressing a, an attitude of patience and faith in the Lord. I believe in God, and I believe God knows what he's doing here. I don't have all the insight, neither do you. And let me tell you something. I, I'm 65 going on 66 this year. I don't even have near the insight I had when I was 18. I knew a lot then. Those of you who are my age understand exactly what I'm saying here. We think we know a lot, right? So here we go. Now, what else is my impatience? It's also an accusation against God. It's like, God, you, you don't, you're not getting this down right. And that insinuation or the actions that you take of impatience in your life are simply a, an expression to God that somehow you think you could do a better job than God's doing with your life. Lesson here is simple. You can't. I can't do a better job at running my life than God can. I spent the first one-third of my life proving that point, that I was totally an idiot when it came to running my own life. I don't care about you saying amen. I know it's true. Amen? And if you'd be honest, we'd say amen to yours as well, your admissions. All those times in my life, in your life, when we've sought to run our life without God's direction, how's that working for you? Not good at all, is it? Point number two, we, all, we got one down, impatience. Point number two is this, expert advice. It says here in this passage in verse 11, nevertheless, the centurion, he believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Now here's the problem. Paul had a word from God, okay? Paul's sitting here with a word from God. The centurion had a word from the ship's owner and master. But you have to understand, the ship's owner and master, he's an expert. Well, you know what an expert, right? The expert's just, you know, a former spurt. <laughs> he's an expert. He, he owns the ship. He knows the ship. He knows how to sell the ship. Paul had a word from God. Uh, the danger is this, you know, that we start listening to people who don't have a word from God or we start listening to what the world dictates to us or even what our own flesh or what the devil dictates to us. The word we need to hear is not what the world offers. It's the word which God offers. And what does God say to us about our situation? You know, this, I said these things all line up with Proverbs. There's this one principle that keeps coming over and over from chapter one all the way to the last chapter 31 of, of Proverbs. And it's this. There's safety in the multitude of counselors. Now, let me tell you another little bit of news that may shock you. All right? Hold on to this. You think you know it all. Mm 
but you don't. You think you know it all. You think you know your situation better than anybody else. You think you know and understand what you're dealing with more than anybody else. Well, I'm going through it, so I know. You may know what's going on, but you don't know how to get on with it and to go through it and to deal with it. Safety in the multitude of counselors. Let's take your present situation, and we're all facing them, amen? How much counsel have I sought? Not from the experts, but from God and wise, mature, godly people. How much counsel have I really sought? If there's safety in the multitude of counsel, by, way, by wise counsel, make war. Over and over those verses keep appearing to us. And then just, uh, who am I looking to? And who am I listening to? And, wh and what, what advice am I considering here? It was the expert advice in this situation that gets them into trouble, all right? There are, there are principles in God's Word. I don't know them all. I want to get to people who know more than I do, so I'm going to surround myself with those kind of people. And we have sought all of my life and my wife and I are together to surround ourselves with men of God and women of God who could give us some good, clear, wisdom, biblical counsel in, in relationship to things. And it's always been surprising how when, once we got a word from somebody and we knew it was from God because it was so clear and it was clean and it was so simple. And biblical. The Word of God is what we weigh everything out in and what we weigh everything by. The Word of God is the full authority and the final authority. So I want to know people who are filled with the Word of God. You know what's killed more churches than anything else? Expert advice. You know what's killing the modern church in America, the contemporary church in America? Expert advice. We have all these experts out in the field tell us how to build big churches, build, draw big crowds, but yet we, ex we exclude the Word of God and we exclude the things of God and teaching people the Word of God. We just want to give them some nice devotionals. How to be a happy person. How to have a happy kid. How to be a happy wife. How to have a happy this. How to do this happy. How to be a happy worker. How to, you know, on and on it goes. And we get advice, and it may be expert, and it may be sounds good, but it may not be right at all. I mean, watch TV. Nine out of ten doctors would recommend yada, yada, yada. Well, why do you think nine out of ten did? Because nine of them didn't care what the product was. They just wanted the paycheck for recommending it. The tenth doctor had some principles. I would tell you, most people in America would probably, if the doc, if the TV came on tomorrow and said, listen, nine out of ten dentists recommend that you gargle with muriatic acid for your fresher smelling breath. I'm sure the muriatic acid sales would go up at least for a day. People would just do it because nine out of, nine out of ten said it. What that, who is that tenth guy? I mean, the story of the prophet in the Old Testament. They said, you're going to tell the king the truth. He said, if I just tell him the truth, he'll just throw me in jail. Because he don't want to hear the truth. He surrounded himself with false prophets. That's the, where the world is. That's what they want. We want the, we want the, we want the leading expert or whatever it might be. But what we want in our life is really more important is what, God does, what, what God's word says and what is his final authority and what does God want and what does he desire for us. True biblical advice. You know, the problem with true spiritual and biblical advice is this, though. It messes up our plans. And when our plans get messed up, we don't like that. I've had a lot of people who just come to my office, and anybody in ministry or counsels a lot of people will tell you the same thing. There are people who will come in to supposedly get counsel, but all they want to do is tell you their idea. And when you tell them that's not biblical, then they get mad and leave the church. Well, pastor, you just didn't agree with me. That's not my job to agree with you. My job is to agree with God and to help you to understand what God's saying. Amen. Expert advice. How many churches, you know, have, have been ruined by that? The third principle is this, discomfort. It says this in verse 12. And because the haven was not commodious to winter. Now, I don't know if that means no commodes or whatever, but no, <laughs> I know what it means, all right. Not, not comfortable. It's, you know, they ain't got any five-star hotels here. There's no nice place to stay. It's not commodious to winter. We, we, the more part, the majority advised everybody to do this, and if by any means they might attain to finish and there to winter. You know, in other words, it's not comfortable here. How many times do we get in that situation in our life? I mean, this is not comfortable. This is non-commodious, all right? This is, not, this is not where I want to be. I don't like being in the middle of this problem. I don't like being in this situation. I don't like being in this circumstances. And so, hey, we got to do whatever we can do just to change the circumstances. How many marriages have been ruined by that mindset? How many businesses have been destroyed by that? How many relationships? How many churches? I mean, Paul, when he's writing to the Philippians, he's trying to let them know that this is not the Christian life to look for the comfort, 
comfortable and the easy way. He said, he said to those people, he said, you want to know what I want, guys? And me as an individual, this is to the Philippians, says, that I might know Jesus Christ and the power of his sufferings. What's that mean? It means that I realize that when I'm willing to be uncomfortable and even to sacrifice and to suffer for Jesus Christ, there is a unique power of the resurrection of God that is manifest in my heart and manifest in my life, and I sense the presence of God closer than any other time. Oh, that I might know him. Let me, let me, let me get rid of a myth. The myth is this. If you're a Christian, you're not supposed to have troubles and go through hard times. If you're a Christian and you're a man of faith and you're a woman of faith, well, you're never going to get sick or sad or sorry. That is not biblical. There's nowhere in the Bible that God says, I'm not going to go through trials from the devil or even failures of my own, but it, it never promises that. In fact, it warns me about that and tells me those things will come. But we do not find in the Bible that God is going to take me out of trouble. We do find in the Bible that God is going to carry me through every trouble and every trial if I hold on to him. Hallelujah. That's the word of God. Daniel in the lion's den. He's not down there saying, well, okay, God, I, 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 you know, they told everybody not to pray to you. And I prayed anyway. And this is what I get. I'm stuck down here with these nasty lions. No. It was trouble that got him there. But the grace of God carried him right through there. Whether it's the Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego in the fire, Daniel in the lion's den, David before Goliath, whatever it is. All these men in the midst of these crises and these problems and these pits and prisons and, I mean, just hell on earth at many times. Through every one of them, God manifests his power and he manifests his glory. I'm not going to walk in the manifest glory of God in my life if everything is sweet and comfortable. It's in the difficulty that God manifests his glory, not only to me and for me, but for the rest of the world around me. We know very little about suffering for Christ. We're sitting here this morning, and we're either going to complain, it's too cold in here, or it's too hot in here, or this cushion may be wearing out on this chair. You know, are those lights too bright for you? Is the sound too loud? And we think we're suffering for Jesus. I don't want to run into Paul in heaven. You know, he says, oh, Paul, you know, I got these, I got these bed sores on my behind from sitting in the pew so long. <laughs> and he starts showing you the three times where he was stoned and lashed and whipped. Now, we'll have glorified bodies, I understand that. But just bear with me in my folly. Man, where'd you get that mark? Oh, man, yeah, it's a stretch mark from eating too much at the church fellowship. <laughs> what a mess we've become, amen? It's all right if you're going through sufferings. We think we're suffering. Well, I don't want anybody to church know I'm suffering. Bless your heart. What a world. It's this idea, this false mindset, you know, that, that expert opinion. It'll ruin our lives every time. Jesus said, my yoke is light, all right? It is light and it's bearable. Because here's the beauty of the yoke. It would, it would fashion, you know, in such a way that two oxen would pull the plow together, harnessed up to that yoke, and they would be there working together step by step and stride by stride. Listen, if you get to feeling things are difficult in your life and you get to feeling that things just seem insurmountable and you feel like you may be all alone because we get to that place, I get that, all right? I just felt all alone and nobody understands what I'm really dealing with. Just take a look to your side, one side or the other. You're going to discover that Jesus is in that yoke with you. He has never left you for one moment. He has not abandoned you even when you disbelieved, even when you failed him. He hang on and he's still hanging on and he's still working in your life to get you where you need to be. He's with you. The fourth thing that will sink your ship is majority rule. We don't need majority rule, we need Jesus rule. And because the haven was not commodious to enter in, the more part advised to depart. How many times have we taken a vote and missed God? I got to get everybody's opinion around me. What do they think? I need to find out what God thinks. Jesus, in the church even, Jesus is the head of the body. You know, it may surprise you that the church is not a, a democracy. This is not a democracy, this is a theocracy. The Bible makes it very clear. Jesus is the head of the body. He's the head of the church. And God gives us as a congregation 
rights and rules that we work by within the scriptures, all right? We, we, we can work together seeking God's face for certain things and certain things, but there's still things that come back to leadership within the body, to pastors and elders, directors and leaders in ministry, those are, that are gifted by God to do certain things. But today we have churches, one after the other, that seem to split over every little thing because they sit back and they sit in a little bit, and they vote on everything that you can possibly imagine. Growing up in those kind of churches, it was horrendous. I remember as a kid, we had a business meeting the first Wednesday after the first Sunday of every month regularly. Whenever the first Sunday came, whatever the first Wednesday was after the first Sunday, you had business meeting. You didn't have prayer. You didn't have Bible study. You didn't have teaching. You had business meeting. We had our little reports, and then everybody had an opinion. I think what we need to do is quit throwing away all that plasticware and wash it in the fellowship because if we wash it, we're saving God money. Let me tell you something. God can afford plasticware. I think that what we need to do is quit buying that double-ply tissue for the toilets and get that single-ply stuff. I mean, hey, it just goes on and on. I think that, I think that. Well, I don't like that idea. Well, I think we ought to do, well, I think, we, and then it just goes on and it vote after vote after, you know what happens every time everybody votes on something? You got winners and you got losers and if you keep voting long enough, everybody loses. And the church usually ends up split because everybody's mad about it. Well, I want a two-ply. I want a two-ply. I can't do that one-ply. That's the stupidity, is it not? Now, I'm not calling you stupid. I'm saying that's stupid. You are stupid if you do that, all right? I'm gonna just forget it. I'm not going to apologize. Majority rule. Take that, take that mindset to the house with you today. Get down. You got five in the family. Get down the kids. They're all sitting around the table and say, hey, guys, I got an idea. You know, just next week, you know, this is the 23rd, and next week's going to be, you know, pay the mortgage. I, how about let's take a vote. How many of you want to pay the mortgage versus how many of you want to go to Disney World? Everybody wants Disney World, raise their hand. Ain't that right? How about instead of mama fixing everybody a good healthy meal tonight, let's take a vote. Healthy meal or marble slab creamery? You know where that's going to go, right? Take a vote. People do it all the time. Do I, do I, do I, do I, be, do I get really right with God in this? Do, do I, do I tithe or buy me a new car? Ah, a new car. That one got real quiet. That wasn't funny. <laughs> I thought it was quite humorous. That one fell off the mountain, didn't it? What I'm saying is simple. The majority will always sink the ship. You need to hear from God. The last is simple. It's favorable circumstances. And when the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by creek. They've been facing hard winds. They've been facing hard times just to get where they got from where they came. It had been a hard trip. They'd been slow going. It had been miserable. There'd been lots of waves. When they're sailing close to the inland, to avoid some of the hassle, and they're going way out of the way to get where they're going. It's just not getting there. And they think, what we need to do is get out of here, guys. We need to make a decision. And we need to, so they vote on it and they make their decision. It's not comfortable here. You know, they're impatient. All these things kind of add up to this one bad thing. And now, soft wind. Ah, I knew it was the will of God. Let's get out of here. Paul said, N -n 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 -n. now hold on, guys. We're going to lose the ship. We're going to lose lives. We're going to lose cargo. It's not going to go the way you think it's going to go. Listen, by the time you get all this stuff added up, your impatience, you know, your expert advice, your discomfort level, your majority rule, the devil will at that very moment blow you a soft wind. Oh, it's going to look good. I think we can pull this off. I think we can do this. You cannot make your life choices, especially in situations you might be dealing with right now, based on what the easiest route is, what the smoothest sailing is going to be. Those people in reality, if you follow Scripture, they're the ones who lose every time. You don't make decisions based on easy. You don't make decisions based on smooth. Those are the people that never really accomplish anything in their life that bring, bring substance and satisfaction. They become losers in life. They're the lazy in life. They're the sluggard in their life. If you go back through Proverbs, there's this same story about the sluggard. They won't plow because it's too cold. They won't get out and do what needs to be done because there's a lion somewhere out there in the woods. You know, they always have an excuse for not working, for not doing, for not reading their Bible, for not praying, for not 
not being diligent, for not sharing Christ. There's always something else that just preoccupies their mind and their attention. And they, they just listen to all the little soft winds that blow their way. Life is not like that. Life is a con- continual and a constant challenge. Life is uphill most of the time. And, and, and here's the thing about it. Just because I choose God's will doesn't mean it's going to be less challenging. I believe it requires more faith. I believe it requires greater fortitude if you're really going to be used by God in your life. God doesn't invite us out to the, to the easy. He invites us out on the water. All right? He pulls us out in the midst of the storm. He sees challenges us at that point to stretch us beyond ourselves and to stretch us beyond our abilities and to get us to a place where we have to believe him and we have to trust him. I mean, the water may be rough, but he masters the water. The wind may be howling on every side, but you understand when you study the Bible, he's the master of the wind. Your situation may be difficult, but you don't take the easy route. Your financial situation may be difficult, but you don't stop giving and you don't start charging. You stay the course, you be diligent, you be disciplined because you'll find out God owns everything anyway and he's going to meet you in the middle of all of it. But you trust him. Your trial, very real, very hot, very difficult. You're in a furnace, it seems to be, in your life. But understand, even in the furnace, well, look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The fourth man, he's there and he's with you. Always. Impossible situations become possible situations. So what are we saying this morning? Write this down in your head and your heart. You must disregard the issue of comfort. You must disregard this patient, impatient thing of wanting to get out ahead of something. You must disregard whatever the majority opinion is. You must disregard whatever the experts are saying. Find out what God's saying. Find out what his word says to you in your situation. Find out what his will is in this situation. If you don't, you will fall on the rocks. Listen, I would have checked out of doing this a long, long time ago. If it was all based on these five elements of comfort and rule and, and, and expert advice and what the world has to say. Satan's aim in every one of our life is to get us to lie down and shut up without any, without any progress, without any forward motion. But I will not lie down and neither will you. I've known some of you long enough to know what you've been through, your failures as well as your successes, and you know as well as I the only reason we get any further down the road is because we take up the courage and the discipline of faith in Jesus Christ and move forward to accomplish what God has called us to accomplish in our homes, our jobs, our family, and our lives. Don't look for an easy out, amen? I believe as we get closer to the return of Jesus Christ every day that this world's falling a little bit more apart and a little bit more apart. And many in the next years, I believe, are going to begin to discover that. And they're going to be looking for a haven that doesn't preach a little easy, smooth, little uh, pat you on the back and rub some Vaseline on your spiritual cancer. They're going to be looking for truth. And you must be that bastion of truth. You must be that city that's set on the hill. You must be the salt of the earth. Because what you're going through in your life today and where you are living and how you navigate this storm of your life is going to play out tomorrow in somebody else's life who's looking for answers. And they'll see you and where you've been and where you came from. And they're going to come. And they're going to come to the right expert for the advice this time. And they're going to make decisions. But you've got to hold on. And you can't bail out. And you can't go back to what you had because it was nothing. People ask me a lot of times, how did you ever keep from going back to the old lifestyle in the early days when there were such addictions and such strongholds and such bondage? Because one day God opened my eyes to see how what a sick and sad, sorry way of living in my life was. That there was something far better and something far higher. And it may be held by the instigate there, but I'm going And I'm moving. And so are you. You're going to stay the course. You're going to say no to all those little voices ringing in your ear that keep trying to turn you around and head you in a different direction. And they never go away. They're always there. I wake up to them. So do you. Do this. Do that. It's easier. It's softer. It's nicer. You have it now. I don't want to live my life that way. And nor do you. I need one more amen. (laughs) 
nor do you. So embrace God. This life you're living, although it may seem it is a long tread, hard tread way to go, a pathway to go, it is so short compared to eternity. And the Bible, Paul said, listen, I don't even compare these struggles and these hardships, and he listed many of them, to the eternal glories that await us. There's a big day coming, hey, and there's a big payday coming. Be faithful to the end. Run the race with patience. The only other option is to end up shipwrecked. Loss of cargo, loss of ship, losses of a life. Be true to the Word of God. Take your present situation, whatever it is right now, weigh it to these standards, see where you are, and don't listen to any other voice but the voice of God. And move higher, move further, go deeper, go longer, go stronger. And your life will be eternally blessed in the regard. So even when you're in the midst of the fire, there's a supernatural abiding peace of God because Jesus is in the fire with you. Somebody say amen. amen. Let's stand with your heads bowed.